The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, good morning. Welcome to the first Workforce Planning webinar from Energy and Utility Skills. Thank you very much for taking the time to join us this morning. Uh, the, the webinar this morning is going to feature myself. I'm Nick Ellins. I'm the Chief Executive of Energy and Utility Skills and also the National Skills Academy for Power. Uh, and the person with the real knowledge who's with me today is Rob Murphy, who's our Workforce Planning Specialist. If you're listening to this live today, because we'll be um, doing... Then uh, you'll be joined by utilities from across the UK. You'll have major contractors on the call and delivery partners. And also, I'm delighted to say, companies from outside of the sector. Now, today's webinar is particularly relevant uh, in light of this week's launch of the industrial strategy. And for those based in England, yesterday's skills summit hosted by the Secretary of State, Justin Greening. Uh, the plans. Um, for a post-Brexit economy feature labour ability, labour market access, right the way throughout the document. And what you'll see across industrial strategy is that infrastructure is absolutely pivotal across all four nations. Uh, what is critical about the labour market is that quantity and quality is needed. So it's genuine human capital. The uh, productivity of the workforce is highlighted as absolutely critical and skills, I'm delighted to say, are recognized as human assets. Now, that already builds on what we've seen in other documents, such as the National Infrastructure Plan, and the document that supports that called the National Infrastructure Plan for Skills. Um, the National Infrastructure Plan is interesting for our sector because 56% of the half a trillion pound expenditure on infrastructure is required to be delivered by us. If you add in our rail and our nuclear partners and in infrastructure, it goes well beyond 90% of the half a trillion. So this is a sector of strategic national importance. And simply put, you just can't have a resilient or sustainable utility sector without a skilled workforce. So what about those people in your organizations and around us all who are skeptical uh, of what's become known as a skills cliff edge? Well, I actually hear that from a lot of senior industry members and stakeholders daily, that there's that cynicism, that there is a problem to fix. And we totally respect that. So I think the easiest way to start is to stick to evidence. And then you and your businesses can decide if proactive action is best. So let me tell you what we know. We know that every major sector in the UK economy is currently reporting difficulty in attracting the right quantity and quality of workforce. No one, no one sector is reporting to be immune from that problem at this time. We know that in our own sector, we have investment commitments that stretch out for decades. There is a job to be done that has to be done, and these are regulated investment commitments, so it's not optional. We also know as a sector, that we have to have a highly skilled workforce to serve 65 million consumers a day with essential services. To the best of my knowledge, we're the only sector of such strategic importance. So what do we do about the, the, uh, the people we might get from the labor market? Does it tell us there's a problem to fix? Well, if we go to that general labor market for our people, we know that we have record employment since 1971, a 42-year record. Uh, we have a record number of people unemployed, also since records began in 71. We know that of the people coming in, EU nationals arriving and seeking work, that it's falling for the first time in 10 years. We know that emigration has gone up from uh, 93,000 to 117,000. And we know that EU nationals working in the UK is already down 200,000. We know that if we look to higher education, the statistics show quite clearly that the utility sector manages to secure around 1% of those people who leave higher education. And we also know that of the pool of unemployed, when you go on to the skilled trades that we need, around 1% of the unemployed actually have the skills potential we need to tap into. From the general labor market, if we go to the, uh, the um, CITB, CIPD, I beg your pardon, they already say that over half of their members are either upskilling or hiring from 
wider society. So the, the pressure is on for that general talent pool. So what happens if we don't go to general talent and we go into the open market and try to compete for someone else's talent? Well, we already know that the costs of recruitment are up and professional salaries are up. And again, the CIPD have been clear in their reports on that one. We know that what was a competitive environment for talent has become very robust and employers are now fighting hard to keep the very best uh, and not fighting so hard to let go of the people who don't meet that criteria. We have a strongly constrained supply. That is a matter of the open labor market records. Uh, and we are faced with competing on those main trades, engineering, uh, groundworks, electricians, with High Speed 2, with Crossrail 2, with Hinkley Point. There's talk of the Cardiff and Swansea tidal barrages needing six figure numbers of engineers for a decade and many, many other large capital projects that are all competing for the same talent up and down the UK. It will be a flowing pool of talent that's needed. So in short, there's no evidence that you don't need to plan, even if you don't genuinely believe the numbers that say there's a problem to be solved. There's something that says businesses in your field need to start planning. So the purpose of today really is quite simple. The purpose of the webinar is to give you some insights. It's to help you get confident with the principles of workforce planning and have access to a professional who knows the subject and can answer your questions. So I'm shortly going to hand over to Rob so he can take you through the webinar. But I've challenged him to do a few things. I've challenged him to keep it as simple as possible for you because this subject has developed a mythology all of its own uh, about it being highly complex. He's going to show you that you can plan affordably. And again, a lot of people are scared of going into workforce planning because of complexity and cost. And I'll give you some of the evidence you need to tackle your boards and your management teams with strategic workforce planning evidence. So on that note, I give you my thanks uh, for entering into the webinar today. I'll join you at the end for the Q&A and I'll hand across to Rob Murphy. Thank you for that introduction, Nick. Uh, morning, everybody. My, my name is Rob Murphy, and I'm workforce planning consultant here at Energy and Utility Skills. Um, so for the next uh, phase of the webinar, I will go through uh, some of the, the, the main challenges to uh, building a resilient and sustainable workforce in the infrastructure sector, some of which Nick has, has covered off, um, but we'll, we'll go into a little bit uh, more detail of what the evidence says then we will um, just light touch, go through what good workforce planning might look like um, and, and how, a, uh, how a model for, for, for that approach can suit different types of, of businesses. And then we'll finish up with any questions at the end. So for the purposes of this webinar, we've identified five labour market challenges in effect to, to building that resilient and sustainable workforce. We, we have evidence, lots of evidence, particularly from Office for National Statistics, to show that we've got the tightest labour market that we've had in over 40 years. We have record high levels of employment, record low levels of unemployment. Uh, and that has shown through into, uh, into labour costs as well. So we know the labour market is, al is already extremely tight. Uh, and that has, has been caused largely, as Nick has, has, has already uh, alluded to, by some intense competition for talent, not just within energy and utilities, but also wider infrastructure, construction and other sectors of the economy as well. We will look at evidence to show that the supply of new talent at the moment is, is already struggling to meet um, uh, demand. Uh, we'll look at the evidence around that. Then we'll also consider what's happening in, in the wider labour market, the changes to the population, the changes to the workforce, um, uh, the, the, the changes in the age profile and, and greater ethnic diversity in the labour market and the implications of that on workforce planning. And then finally look at some of the evidence to, to, to suggest that um, businesses need to ad adapt to not only a, a, an uncertain uh, future, but also changing demands, particularly from a, a customer perspective. So what is the evidence that we have the, the, the tightest labour market for over 40 years? 
Well, it, it's a fact that we have the highest employment level since records began in 1971 round about or just over 32 million people are employed at the moment 317,000 more than this time last year and three quarters of all 16 to 64 year olds are currently in employment nearly 80 percent of men in that age bracket are in employment and just over 70 percent of women and that's the highest since records began in in 1971 it's also a fact that we have record low unemployment. Although 1.4 million people are unemployed at the moment, it is 215,000 fewer than this time last year and represents just 4.3% of all the economically active uh, people in the UK, which is the lowest figure since 1975. Um, and again, it, it is historically low for men, lowest since 1975. And for women at 4.2%, it's the lowest figure since comparable records began in 1971. We also have very low levels of economic inactivity. So these are people who are outside of the labour market. So these include students, around about 2.3 million students. It includes the long-term sick, the retired, and, and around about 21, 22% of 16 to 64 year olds are currently economically inactive. So they are not looking for work. And again, that is the lowest level since records began in 1975, uh, 1971, sorry. Um, Interestingly, the, the number of people who are carers and staying at home to look after family, uh, again, that, that's about 2 million people, but that is the lowest um, since that type of data was collected in, in 1973. So we get a picture there that the, the resident labour market within the UK is, is already quite stretched, that there, is, there doesn't appear to be much room for, for that uh, for that labour market in terms of the number of people available for employment to increase um, uh, substantially um, th through its own efforts. And that tightness in the labour market is beginning to feed through into, into some of the labour costs. The, the median full-time gross salary across the UK at the moment is 2% is higher than it was this time last year. There are some regional variations there. Not surprisingly, London and the South East is up the most at 2.9%. Uh, Yorkshire, Humber and the North East are, are up the lowest at 1.2%. At and there are some industrial uh, variations there. Across the, the infrastructure sector, um, median salaries are up by, by much more than, than the 2% uh, across sewerage particularly and, and electricity and gas it's up near 7% um, on the year uh, and in civil engineering it's up 5.7% and there's some interesting occupational um, variations there as well it's not just higher skilled occupations that are demanding higher wages um, it's also elementary construction, that's up nearly 5%. Plant operatives uh, are up 3.3%. So it, it appears that the, the tightness of the labour market is not just at the higher skilled end, it's also um, feeding down through, through the entire workforce. And, and we, we, we've been picking up anecdotal evidence um, in parts of the country where, uh, for example, round about Hinkley Point in the southwest, um, of, uh, of, of, of current skilled workers requesting significantly higher pay rises to, to maintain their, their, their relationship with their current uh, employer. So it does appear that um, that tightness of the labour market is feeding through into, into substantially higher wages. Uh, the intense competition doesn't um, seem to be fading at all. Um, the number of vacancies across the UK economy at the moment is 786,000, which is up 4.3% on the year. And that's 2.6 vacancies for every 100 people in employment. In electricity and gas, we have about 4,000 vacancies, slightly down on the year. Um, but not by much, 4.3% represents uh, about 180 people. 
Um, in water and sewerage with 3,000 vacancies, that's up 6% on the year. And in, in construction at 32,000 vacancies, that's up 26%, more than uh, a, a quarter more vacancies over the year than, uh, th than we've been used to. So, so we, we, we get a sense there that the, the competition is intensifying. Is, as Nick alluded to in his introduction, the, the National Infrastructure Pipeline gives us some visibility of the, um, of, of the type and the level of activity going on in the infrastructure sector in the UK. And between now and 2021, slightly beyond, uh, there's nearly, uh, well, just about 440 billion pounds worth of investments going on. 85% of that is in energy, transport, and, and the utilities and waste management. And, and that type of uh, that level of investment, the Home Office have predicted that that will require around about 100,000 more people over that time period and could represent about a quarter of a million upskilling interventions. So you, you, you get a sense there of the scale of the challenge. And this that data on, on the chart there excludes the next price control periods of electricity, gas and water. It doesn't include Crossrail 2. It doesn't include the, the, the potential for the Cardiff and Swansea tidal barrages. Um, so th this is just the, the, the known pipeline as it stood in, in the spring of this year. And um, interestingly, the CIPD have, have done some work as of uh, CBI, which has indicated that the, the, the slowdown in, in hiring intentions, or actually there isn't a slowdown of hiring intentions, even though there are political uncertainties around Brexit and what that um, might and how it might impact upon the, 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 the labour market. CBI's latest education and skills survey uh, suggests that 61% of businesses are not confident that they'll be able to recruit the talent they need. And we've been having conversations with, with, our, with companies in the energy and utility sector about the uh, potential impact of, of Brexit. And, and, and the, the feeling seems to be that they're more concerned with the indirect impacts of Brexit in that there will be an even more tightening of the resident labour market. So not worried particularly about the direct impact of, of Brexit. But as the CBI uh, data shows, 72% of companies are concerned that post Brexit, um, competition for well qualified talent will be expected to, uh, to increase. So with the tightness of the labour market, um, the uh, leading through into uh, into greater salary expectations and labour costs, with the uh, the national infrastructure and and all the work that we know is going on in and around the sector, it is leading to some evidence that employers are are um, suffering from skill shortages. Now this slide presents data from the last UK employer skill survey. And, and it says that in electricity, gas and water, 36% of all vacancies at that time were reported by employers to be skill shortages. Now, whether you believe that statistic or not, I think what we can take from this slide is that the uh, of, of the 65,000 businesses that were surveyed um, in, in this exercise, the rank they were all asked the same question and were given the same opportunity to, to, to answer. But what came out top was infrastructure sectors, electricity, gas and water, construction and transport and comms. So whether we can actually believe that around about a third of all vacancies are skill shortages, we'll, we'll, we'll leave that to, to, uh, to individual employers to, uh, to take as, as they see fit. But what we can take from it is that the, the ranking of the sectors, it looks as though infrastructure is pretty significantly um, affected. Um, <clears throat> and part of the reason for that, uh, particularly at, at the higher skills level, um, through some work that Engineering UK have carried out um, through their annual um, 
or, or delivered through their annual State of the Nation report, they estimate that engineering enterprises will need about 265,000 workers per year to meet demand through to 2024. And that could mean a shortfall of about 20,000 engineering graduates per year. Uh, and that is what they feel is a conservative estimate given the modelling they've done. And we, we do have evidence from the Higher Education Statistics Authority, which show that the number of starts in general engineering, civil engineering, and particularly electrical engineering degree courses has declined slightly over the last couple of years. So I think we've been quite used to over the last um, uh, five to eight years seeing uh, STEM coming higher up the agenda um, and, and, and there being a general perception that, that, that STEM skills are, are more attractive and it's something that young people want to get into. I think that might be true generally but there are pockets where we, we need to pay particular attention to and I was with a, a major um, energy supplier yesterday um, who gave evidence of that they do struggle to recruit good quality electrical engineering degree graduates. Um, but also we, we, uh, there's been a lot in the press over the past week about the dip in apprenticeship numbers. Um, Nick might uh, have some words on, on this uh, perhaps later, um, but it, whether this is just a short term blip as a result of the, uh, of the new uh, funding um, arrangements that, that have come into play. Um, so generally we, we get this picture that, that supply is, is struggling to meet current demand and through the National Infrastructure Plan we have visibility that this could get more intense in future years. Now the population and the labour market is also changing uh, and this presents both an opportunity potentially and, 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 and challenges. An opportunity in that the resident labour market through to 2041, so about 24, 25 years time, is expected to grow by just over 7 million people. So that potentially gives us a greater labour market to recruit from. There'll be um, around about a third of a million more under 16 year olds by that time. There'll be an extra 3.2 million people wor of working age. Uh, but interestingly, there'll be 3.9 million more people of pensionable age. And you can see the chart on the right, the, uh, the, the inner part of the chart, the, the, the turquoise uh, solid bars, that is the population per year as it stood in 2016. So you can see round about uh, 16 years ago with the turn of the millennium, there was, there was a reduction in the birth rate. Hence, the, uh, the, po the population pyramid there um, gets narrower. You can see about 30-year-olds and 50-year-olds, there was, there was a bit of a baby boom, the 50-year-olds coming in the 1960s. And you can see the effect of the end of World War II at 70-year-olds, where there was a substantial peak in the birth rate. And what Office for National Statistics predicts over this time is that even in a, a, a low a low migration scenario where Brexit and, and immigration controls be particularly tough, the population as a whole would still grow by about 5 million people. And you can see the, the effects there, particularly at the lower age scales. Uh, the high birth rates that have been um, in play since the millennium are expected to, to, to bulk out that, uh, that hourglass um, uh, population pyramid below 20 year olds but you can see the effect higher up as well at the pyramid where there'll be far more people of pensionable age particularly females who have a, a higher life expectancy so it presents an opportunity in that the uh, the working age population could increase by about 3 million people but there'll be a greater population to serve. So that will be greater pressure on infrastructure, on the supply of, uh, of, of energy and of water. Um, so, so that may well lead through into uh, increased demand on the sectors. There'll also be greater um, ethnic diversity within the workforce. 
uh, the proportion of black, Asian and minority ethnic people in the population is expected to double over the next 25 years to, to get up to about one quarter of the population. So at the moment, 43% of the working age population are white males. It is, it is predicted that that will become quite a substantial, um, substantially smaller proportion over the next 25 years. Indeed, in London, uh, black, Asian and minority ethnic people already outnumber white people in every age group up to 20 years of age. So the, uh, the, the black, Asian minority ethnic population is generally younger and that will show and feed through into the workforce over the next few years. So the, the, the chart on the right um, is specific to the energy and utility sector and the dark regions, the dark shaded regions, are those regions where the ethnicity of the, of the, of the workforce in energy and utilities is substantially lower than, than that of its resident labour market. So you can see all along the, the, the east going down into the south of the country. Um, the proportion of, of uh, black Asian minority ethnic people in the energy and utility workforce is substantially lower than that of its resident population. And that really should be the benchmark. If you're benchmarking your organisation on, on gender and, and uh, sorry, on um, ethnic diversity, you really need to measure yourself against your residents and your, 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 your labour market in which you recruit, not against sector average, because that will vary substantially. If you're in London, you might expect about a third of your workforce to be uh, black, Asian uh, and minority ethnics. If you're up in the northeast, then it, it would be uh, somewhere in the region of about 4%. So picking the right benchmarks is important in this. We'll come back to that a bit later on. But what it does point to is that over the next 20 years or so, the way in which companies engage with um, with, with with their, their, their labour market and particularly those non-traditional, uh, non-white, non-male particularly uh, workforces is, is really going to need to change and, and has to be a, a step change there. So we need to adapt to, to a new future. Um, the labour market is getting more diverse, it's growing, people are working longer. Um, technology and data um, is, is changing the way that not only uh, uh, companies operate and the skills mix required, um, we also have a, a, a greater um, emphasis on, on security, both of physical assets, but also of personal data. We're collecting more data as, as a sector than we ever have done before. It, we need to make sure that we have the skills to, to use and interpret that data correctly, but also to keep it safe regulation and competition. Um, competition is certainly increasing, yeah, particularly in, in, in the water sector. On the regulation side of things, we are seeing signs that regulators are beginning to, uh, to see the value of, um, of, of employers working together to, to work towards a more resilient and, and sustainable workforce. And customer expectations are, are ever increasing. And um, and, 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 and there's pressure on, on the utilities, particularly to enhance the customer experience. Um, so all of these are, are, are could be reliant on skills that have been generally not that utilised in the utilities over over uh, the, the previous 20 years. They're going to be quite different to the next 10 years. Um, so we're going to be looking at, at, at more customer service skills, professional and business skills, uh, supervisory leadership management. So recruiting uh, graduates that, that also have uh, management and leadership skills, data analytic, analytics, procurement, and, um, and, and, and a greater base level of skills in literacy and numeracy. So, so I think what we've gone over there, and you'll notice that none of the data there really came from energy and utility skills. The vast majority of it is in the public domain through Office for National Statistics, through CBI, through CIPD. So there, I think we can take from that a general sense that things are, are tight and that um, business as usual is, is probably um, a dangerous option to take, particularly if we look over the next 10, next 10 to 20 years. 
So now what we are going to do is take a look at how we can, um, as a sector, um, look at how we can do workforce planning in a way that suits the, the needs of, of the individual organisation and of, of the sector as a, as a whole. And I think the first thing to say with this is that workforce planning is a business issue, it's not just a HR issue. If, you, if it's left to the HR team, I think there's, there's a, a, a plethora of, of intelligence and information and expertise that could well be missed out on. But that doesn't mean that it has to be complicated, time consuming and, and expensive. It's about taking an approach that suits the needs of, of your organisation. Now that might be light touch, you might just look at the impact of retirements and staff turnover and uh, if, you, if you're not anticipating any particular workforce growth that might be perfectly uh, suitable for your organisation and then take a little bit of a view of how you're going to get those people in a, a, at a high level. Now even at that level, that, that, that can be very useful. Um, a couple of years ago I worked with a company who, who, who thought that yeah, retirements are going up but it's an issue that we've got under control. Where actually when we analysed the data, we, we saw that in the early 2020s, the number of people due to retire would be almost three times their long-term trend. And that was just a phenomenon of, of the workforce that they employed at that time. But until they looked at the data, even at that very high level, they start to get a sense of, of issues that might come down the track. So it's all about greater visibility and the dynamics of your workforce. You might start to get a bit more detailed if you want to get a bit more sophisticated. So you might start to build in um, some information around the, the, your current vacancies and your planned uh, workforce growth or reductions. You might start to segment your workforce out into different business units. Um, the dynamics of your workforce might be very different in your engineering departments to your customer service, for example. And you might start to take a high level view of the competition for skills around in your labour market, both at a, at a sector level, but also locally and, and regionally from, from, from other sectors. Um, and, and, and start to get a bit more sophisticated in how you, um, how you look at the, the employment um, or the recruitment opportunities that are, that are open to you. Um, or you could go more in depth. And this is, is probably what, what gold standard looks like. So you, you start to consult more widely, you bring in your regulation people, your learning and development, your operations, your, your procurement. You start to, to really look at how you segment your workforce. And something that I've noticed over the past two years or so, companies are now segmenting their workforce primarily by pension scheme. So they're looking at the, the dynamics of their workforce that are on the, the old um, defined benefit schemes. Where, where staff turnover is, is low, uh, you can pretty much predict when people are going to retire uh, and they're not going to leave until they get their pension. But on the more, um, uh, the, the more recent uh, defined um, contributions, uh, workforce is generally younger, higher staff turnover, the pension isn't a particular tie to the company anymore. So that can be one workforce segment to pay particular attention to. Um, you might start to do some, some more detailed uh, time series uh, analysis of your competition for trend. Which are the projects in, in your locality that might impact upon you? Are you within the footprint of Hinkley or HS2 uh, or near a major offshore wind port hub? Um, so there are a number of things that you can start. If you start at, at, a, at a light touch level, then as you get used to it and as the, your, your data requirements get more and more sophisticated, then, then, then you, can, you can build in additional elements as you, as you see fit and, and as you have the expertise to, to do that. So the way that we tend to work through with companies is establish a little working group, make sure that everyone within your organisation that can either influence workforce planning or be influenced by workforce planning is engaged. Have a look at how you sent make your workforce, whether you need to do it by, by pension arrangements, by business unit, by region. Um, it can be quite dangerous to, to assume that your workforce is one homogenous group of employees. So turnover will, will differ by, by certain job roles or different business units. So pay some particular attention to workforce segmentation. 
Then gather your workforce data, get the data that you need out of your HR system and start building in intelligence from your business plans, from your strategic plans about how your workforce requirements might change. So you apply some assumptions to your HR workforce. When are people going to retire? What's your staff turnover rate? Bring in, um, bring in the, the assumptions on your future workforce growth. Then take a step back, review the data that you've got. Um, this can be a, a, a useful uh, uh, point to, to, to take a breath. Everyone review the data. Is your workforce structure right? Just just to make sure that, that your HR data is, uh, is, is, is fit for purpose, that you've got people in the right job families, for example. So just take a step back, review the data, review what the initial uh, assumptions are telling you. Then look outside of your organisation. What's the world around you? What's the demand for skills in your sector and in your locality? And then you can consider, with all that knowledge, how are you going to recruit the talent that you need into the business? What, and what, what are the recruitment avenues? Do you need to look at certain aspects of the external labour market? Might it be appropriate to target um, armed forces or long-term unemployed or young people, as well as your, your graduate schemes and your apprenticeships and your, your internal upskilling pathways? Not forgetting, of course, that you can't fill all your vacancies by, by upskilling. At some point, you need new blood coming into the organisation. So making sure that backfill effect is included. And then because we don't know what the future will hold, produce scenarios. Um, so look, you could look at high, medium, low um, workforce growth scenarios. What happens if your staff turnover increases because um, Hinkley Point or, or the tidal barrages in, in, in South Wales are going to be sucking in uh, technical talent? So just be aware of what the opportunities and what the challenges might be in the future. And then produce your appropriate outputs, consult, disseminate internally, give people confidence within your organisation, particularly higher up your board, um, your, your, uh, your contractual customers, that you've got this under control, that you've, 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 you've considered all the, the aspects that you can and, uh, and you have a plan that no matter what the future holds, you can, uh, you, you've got a plan to, to meet all that. And so the benefits of an approach like that can be is that you, you'll get a greater understanding generally as you go through the process of the dynamics of your current workforce. When do people retire? Where are their high pockets of high staff turnover, for example? So hopefully you can start to avoid skill shortages or even the oversupply of particularly trainee data, making sure that you'll, you, you'll have enough vacancies for all your trainees to come into. It can help you on the redeployment of staff because you'll be modelling out business unit by business unit um, where, where pockets of demand will be and where you may have excess staff because of, uh, of staff reductions. It also puts your, your challenges within that wider context which will allow you to make an informed judgment as to how difficult it's going to be to get your talent uh, into the business. And it will also align your HR strategy with your, your strategic plan, your business plan, and more importantly, your, your finance plans. So what companies often say when we work with them in, in, in a framework like this is that they get as much benefit, probably more benefit from the process, from the engagement and the asking the questions of their business and of their own workforce data than they do with the actual data outputs. Yet it can be very useful to know that you'll need X number of, of a certain discipline of engineer um, over, over the next couple of years, but they learn so much more from the engagement processes that they go through in their business. So really, if, if people are your primary asset, then, then workforce planning at however level of, of sophistication you, 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 you feel is appropriate for your business should be integral to your, your governance processes and to your planning processes. So to, to, to sum up, my, my five top tips would be workforce planning isn't just a HR issue. Um, you'll gain a lot of value by, uh, by consulting widely within your organisation from, from your regulation teams, from procurement, from learning and development and, um, and, and really get to know your workforce dynamics. You will almost certainly have critical job roles which you may well have already identified. So pay particular attention to them. What is their staff turnover rate? What, when do they normally retire? 
and, and what do your, your, your business and strategic plan say about um, increasing um, th that workforce? So really get to know how your workforce operates um, and don't treat the workforce as one homogenous group of people that all have the same staff turnover rate and they all retire at the same time. Be mindful of the world around you. Um, I, I, I can't stress this uh, 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 too much, to be honest, uh, because that will really determine the, 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 the level or the extent to which you will be able to recruit your talent. So really be mindful of what's going on in the world around you. And that both might be locally, regionally, nationally, it might be internationally, and also across sectors. So it's just not just about who is recruiting exactly the same talent as you, it's also who is going to be drawing in the skilled technical talent. Consider collaborating, whether that's with, with, with peer organisations, so water companies working together to get an industry-wide view, or down through your supply chain. Your supply chain will be recruiting very similar um, talent to, to what you will, to what an, an asset owner would. So consider collaborating with your workforce. Uh, with, with your supply chain, sorry. And of course, we don't know what the future is going to hold, so, so look at different scenarios. Um, and, and, and those scenarios might be quite straightforward, high, low, medium, growth, what happens if staff turnover goes up, but, but whatever is appropriate for, you, for your organization's particular um, context. Okay, so, so that is really the, the, the end of, of, the, of, the, of the webinar. We'll come on to questions uh, now. Uh, just very quickly to say that um, energy and utility skills um, has, uh, has, a, has a track record of supporting companies like yours in, in making sure that they, that they have the right level of workforce planning for their particular circumstances. So we can help you with upskilling your, your HR teams or, or, or your internal steering groups. We can provide the labour market intelligence that, we, uh, that we've seen over the course of this webinar if you don't have the means to gain that um, within your organisation. So now I think uh, we will we'll go to questions if there are any. Um, everyone I think is now uh, unmuted. So, uh, so me and, and, and Nick uh, are on hand to, to answer any questions. Are there any questions out there from any of the audience? Right, okay. So, regulations uh, this is absolutely yes, and regulators have a statutory duty to the resilience and the sustainability of the sector, and they have to demonstrate that to their respective sectors, estates, or ministers. Um, as, a, as a formal part of the process. So one of the things that's happened, you'll see, is Ofwat is a very good example. They've recently developed an approach called Resilience in the Round. Uh, and if you get a chance to take a look at their document, Resilience in the Round, you will see workforce planning, planning labour, uh, all the way through that. Uh, I've just noticed that it's come up, and I've just come off up unmuted here, so I'm not sure whether you actually picked up... Um, uh, what I've said, but I'll keep going. We can always cover it back again. Resilience in the round document for off watch, you will see the workforce planning and labor market points that Rob has made right the way throughout the off watch document. Um, and off watch have been quite clear that when they go into the next price review, uh, dubbed PR19 for the price review, uh, the decision year they make PR19, uh, that they will be looking at the whole subject of labor markets and how companies prepare to be resilient and describe their focus on this area as significant. Uh, and so I know some companies on this call have already had interactions with the resilience team at Ofwat and have been told broadly there will be a checklist of questions that marry up with a lot of what Rob's said today as Ofwat looks for that comfort. With Ofgem, they are moving into the establishing the new Rio 2 model. Um, and it's a slightly different approach, but equally comes with that same hands off of do we have the incentives and mechanisms right within Rio 2 to allow companies to plan to be resilient businesses? And Ofgem are talking to us at the moment with the membership around how we make sure that is 
the case, but it's the same question, the same scrutiny of the business plans to understand that there's a considered and methodical approach to workforce planning, not just to understand the current skills in your business and how you keep that going, but also to the outside of the business challenges you will face in the coming years and how you're going to meet it. So that in essence of just those two regulators is how they're thinking, but I know from talking to colleagues in other sectors that a number of the economic regulators have got similar mindsets as they work towards their statutory resilience and sustainability duties. So that was the first one, Rob. I've got another email to me at the moment, which is around uh, language. How, how do HR people convince their boards and their management teams to pay more attention to the HR language? Um, this is a really interesting one. And what I, what, one of the things that became quite clear quite early on is that boards and directors focused on economic regulation understand the language of infrastructure and financial returns, but don't necessarily understand the language of skills. So what became clear quite early on is you have to change your language to the audience. Uh, they're focused on uh, regulatory capital value. And you'll see a number of large utility businesses now are talking quite openly about human capital value and human assets. Now, that language doesn't necessarily sit particularly easy with HR teams. In fact, they might find that language quite offensive in terms of HR teams. But the point is, who is the audience? And when you're discussing human capital value and human assets, you will naturally get an affinity with that type of audience to understand the financial impact on the business and its importance. And as I started off with today, quite frankly, without the human capital, the rest of it doesn't deliver itself anyway. Um, there's a very, very interesting couple of papers been done by the energy company SSE, uh, super guy HR director there called John Stewart on human capital, uh, and they've actually worked out the value of human capital and the, how the investment in training can increase human capital value. And they're just doing a follow up report on the actual financial value of investing in inclusion and diversity. So I would strongly recommend having a look at the work SSE are doing. But it's the choice of language there to influence the audience you need to make sure this goes straight to the boardroom and to senior discussions and doesn't get left to an HR team to discuss as replacing skills. So that was the only other written question I've got. OK, well, unless there are any more questions uh, from people who are online, I think it just leaves me to say thank you very much for, for joining us and, and thanks to Nick for, for his input. Um, if, if you want to discuss any of the, uh, of the issues that, uh, that we've raised today, feel free to get in touch with either myself or Nick. Um, but and, and have a good Friday and, and a good weekend. And, and hopefully we'll speak to you soon. Take care. Bye.